So, so here we go. Um, green corn for positive soil microbial interactions. Can we, okay, so I've given two talks here, and they have to do with breeding corn that was higher in protein content and higher in essential amino acids. And it didn't yield as well, but it, it produced more protein per acre, potentially. Well, the question is, can we do that routinely from farm to farm? Is it possible? And are there some ways that we can increase the reliability of protein content in that grain? So we're very interested in this quality. Being able to, if we had a bag of high methionine corn, make sure that, or high protein corn, that the farmer really would get that high protein. So we were interested in whether we can increase the reliability of our, of our corn variety by inoculating with different bacteria. And there were some, some uh, different examples of why this might be interesting, uh, an interesting way to go. Uh, Sugarcane production in Brazil basically occurs with very little fertilizer or no fertilizer because, uh, as Lori was mentioning, there are these uh, bacteria that live inside the plant and actually fix nitrogen. So that's a heck of a better deal than what we have here uh, for producing, um, producing ethanol. Because they don't need the nitrogen fertilizer in order to get the sugar cane, which they then use to, to make ethanol. Um, on the other hand, at the UW, Madison, uh, there was a group working on inoculating corn with bacteria, and they did find that it increased yields, but it didn't alleviate nitrogen stress. So corn wasn't fixing nitrogen, but it might be stimulating the plants. Um, and they were using nitrogen-fixing bacteria in order to establish that. On the other hand, there's recently there's an exciting group down in Uruguay that's working on nitrogen fixation in corn and trying to estimate how much of it gets fixed. And it could be as much as a third of the nitrogen in the plant, according to some isotope studies. And they identified a community of bacteria that was inside the plant, not on the, necessarily on the root, but inside the plant that can fix nitrogen. There's actually quite a bit of, of older work that suggests that varieties of corn differ in terms of their ability to actually uh, work with microbes and fix the nitrogen. And um, one of the issues that comes up is why? Why should some varieties be susceptible to be able to work with the bacteria and other varieties not be able to do that? And it could be that some of them have set a higher threshold uh, in terms of their defense systems. And if that defense system gets turned on, they're not going to let bacteria grow in. Uh, so um, one of the issues for us in the Midwest with our corn is that we have a, a very fusarium-rich system. And fusarium, for those who know it, is, is ubiquitous. It's a, it's a potential pathogen for, for crops. It's a potential toxin-producing um, endophile can produce uh, vomitoxin and other nasty substances if, if conditions aren't right. It's also um, present in our soils. It affects root rot in uh, Wisconsin conditions. And it's, it's, um, it, it lives inside the plant and it defends itself. It's well adapted to our corn. In fact, what's happened with our corn is that we have bred corn that produces large amounts of natural antibiotics um, Dimboa is, is a, a classical one, uh, um, and it, it's a naturally used to, we, we bred the corn to have high levels of Dimboa in order to control the first generation of European corn borers. And that was a, a, a concerted effort by many breeders and many different institutions to breed this disease, uh, this insect-resistant corn, and that particular substance that's produced in our corn and by the, by the tops and by the roots are similar compounds in the roots. Um, fusarium does very well when that particular substance is available, whereas other endophytes don't do well in the presence of Dimboa. So it's very possible that we have selected corn that actually, um, where fusarium thrives, it can, it can protect its niche with uh, certain substances that it makes, and the uh, bacteria that might live in the plant are at a somewhat competitive disadvantage. So that's, that's a kind of a hypothesis that we have that, gee, will, will occur. So that might be a good reason why conventional corn might not do so well with bacteria. That's just a hypothesis, but we have some, some thinking behind that. 
Now, one of the things that um, we did, actually Martha Rosemeyer, who's here, was somewhat involved in, in these studies, um, was that we looked at root health um, across uh, different farming systems. We looked at conventional farms and organic farms. I'll tell you in a minute why this is relevant. And what we found, what we looked at uh, three years, in three different states, and um, we looked at 47 conventional farms. We did strip trials with and without fertilization on these farms, replicated strip trials. And what we found was a much higher level of root disease at in feasts when the plant was flowering for the uh, conventional than we did for the organic. And you see the differences were highly significant, almost double the root disease for the conventional as for the organic. It was particularly uh, prevalent for corn followed after corn you see it on the left side. And um, we saw these differences. There, were, there was a wide range within the organic. There was a wide range within the conventional. Uh, we had ideas why there were those ranges. But obviously, the organic farmers were doing something in their farming system to um, reduce the incidence of root disease. Now, it could be that they had better soil quality. <coughs> the roots were healthier because they could get more oxygen. They were distressed. And therefore, they weren't so subject to pathogenesis. That's my hypothesis of what might be going on. There's a difference in soil quality. It reflects itself in root health. Whether that's the case or whether it's suppressive soils because the organic farmers are using more organic matter and the, the, the bacteria, the decomposing uh, caused by the, or the, the bacterial growth and the, and the communities that are formed in the decomposing organic material antagonize uh, fusarium. Or, or stimulate roots, I don't really know. But in practice, what was happening was a difference in root health. And that got me thinking, gosh, you know, if you have a, a farming system, continuous corn, and the rooting systems are being attacked because or they're unhealthy, will they be able to harbor micro microorganisms that might provide benefits, such as nitrogen fixation? Or would they have their defenses turned off? And want to exclude any bacteria that could do that kind of work. And so that's, that was part of the whole questioning that I was um, led into. We did, a, we did a set of trials initially with azosporillum, uh, with our corn, and we, we um, simply inoculated seed or didn't inoculate it. I got some inoculum very late in the season before we planted. And so we just put out strips with and without the inoculation. and where we had not fertilized at all, we saw actually some somewhat convincing increases in grain protein. Now, whether that's for real or not, we didn't know. It was not a replicated trial. It was just strips that we put out, but fairly consistent increases on average of the, um, of the um, protein content um, between yes, where we inoculated and no, where we didn't inoculate. That was kind of encouraging. Well, in 2009, we had some trials on a piece of ground where we took a number of our different inbreds. I'd spoken about them uh, earlier in the morning, but um, what we had was we had a piece of ground that hadn't been fertilized in four years. And sometimes it's difficult to get ground to do research on. You have to take what you can get. And we planted the corn out there and we had a cold grown season. And the corn, in general, it hadn't been fertilized in four years, no legumes. Uh, there had been some cereal crops grown on it. It was under organic production. And the corn looked, in general, pretty anemic. It looked uh, chlorotic, let's put it that way, and, and throughout the growing season. However, there were, uh, and there were differences, and I spoke about this earlier in the day, uh, about some of the chlorophyll differences between the different varieties. And what, in general, what was going on is we had a lot of uh, varieties that we had taken from PVP lines that had been produced by different companies, uh, from Monsanto and Pioneer, who made hybrids and so on, and they looked rather chlorophyll. And we had some of our own breeding lines, and they looked, they looked like they had more chlorophyll, and we measured the chlorophyll, and yes, they did. But we also had a few um, accessions of corn um, that were exotic, and they had black green leaves, some of them. The leaves were black, green, and had chlorophyll contents ranging up to 65, which is very high in, in terms of a, of a multi-chlorophyll meter, which indicates a highly fertilized condition. 
And you can see over here, you can see uh, B73, which is a, a classic, classic inbred that's in almost all the corn grown in the center part of the corn belt. And on, on the uh, right-hand side, you can see the land race, two of the land races. Uh, you can see the difference in, in foliage color. Um, and that difference was fairly consistent through the growing season. So something was going on there. Everything had been inoculated with Aces Spirillum again, or the entire nursery. And um, we were kind of excited about it. What the heck is going on here? Well, when we, we dug up the uh, roots, we thought, well, maybe they've just got fantastic rooting systems, and they're able to extract enormous amounts of nitrogen from the soil. But they actually had smaller rooting systems in B73. Um, and uh, let's see, what else we've got here? Oh, now this is the other thing. So we measured delta the natural abundance of the of nitrogen isotopes. So there's two isotopes in question. One is N14, one is N15. There's a certain balance between the two in the air. There's, and uh, it's different than the balance between the two that you have in the soil, in the soil organic matter. And that's because in the soil, there's the bacteria, they select, selectively release through denitrification. They release N, the lighter isotope back into the air. So organic matter is actually more concentrated in N15 than it is than, it, it, than, the, in, than the air has. And it's possible to do a kind of a ratio called the delta N15. And this delta N15 gives you an idea of well, where is the nitrogen coming from? And it turned out with some of these very black green leafed corns that they had rather low delta N15 ratios indicating that some sort of fixation might be occurring from the air, they're getting their nitrogen from the air. Not proving it, but suggesting it. Uh, let's look at the chlorophyll scores that we had, uh, the PVP lines. Um, we had 15 of them, average uh, number of plants scored 17, chlorophyll score 37. Um, commercial inbreds from a cooperator, 40, average chlorophyll score. Michael Fields breeding lines, 45. Um, chlorophyll scores for these um, exotics, 54. This was a very special group of exotics that we've selected for very special quality purposes. Well, they were doing something. If we looked at the um, delta N15 ratios, um, they on average were not so different, but there were certain ones in this particular group that were very low, down to 3.21. If we were to take the highest and the lowest and sort of calculate where the highest would be the one uh, that was kind of the check, it would have been as much as half of the nitrogen being fixed in those particular lines, if that was, was what really was going on. So uh, the next year, well, we, we took those particularly exciting uh, populations and we made hybrids with, with some of our corn and we grew them out and we tested them relative to four different conventional hybrids. And um, we had four different seed treatments. We disinfected the seed, um, and that disinfection was, was due to a heat treatment combined with Clorox. Uh, and it's a treatment method that was developed by the uh, Fusarium Group in Athens, Georgia. Um, or we disinfected and inoculated with a mix of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Um, or we didn't disinfect, we just inoculated with bacteria. And then again, we had a control of nothing. And we grew it on, a, on uh, three replications um, uh, on, on, a, on a site after soybeans. And this is what happened. If we look at the yields for the conventional hybrids, we have four different hybrids. This is our average yields for disinfected, disinfected with inoculate, inoculate, and nothing. And you can see there was very little effect of, of, inoculation, of inoculation here. However, there was a large effect in the disinfection. We removed the fusarium and the yields plummeted. On the other hand, with the, the um, experimental hybrids, uh, what we had was um, disinfection. Um, there was a, a slight effect of, of, of inoculation here on yield. And once again, if we inoculate it here, you can see the difference that we inoculated at 135 bushels and we nothing had 111. 
if we look at the effects of inoculation, we've got the, the Michael Fields experimental hybrids, and we've got the normal hybrids here. The backgrounds, the experimental ones, and you can see the effect of inoculation had no effect on, on plant population. But um, inoculation did increase yield for the, um, for the uh, experimental hybrids. So inoculating did something for those things. Whereas, and also for the yield of essential amino acids, you can see how inoculation also increased the yield of essential amino acids in the protein content. Whereas it didn't do anything for the conventional hybrids that we could detect. So the plants, those plants, that group of plants seem to be somehow responding to bacterial inoculation, whereas the normal hybrids didn't seem to be responding to bacterial inoculation. However, when we looked at um, Delta N15, we didn't see any difference between them. Basically, we didn't see nitrogen fixation. Now, this was on this year when we grew this corn, it was a wonderful year. There was no signs of any nitrogen deficiencies. And I suspect that what was going on was that basically, and we didn't prove this, but I, I suspect that what's going on is in a great year where the plants could get as much nitrogen as they need, there's no need to fix nitrogen. And that somehow the system is turned on under conditions where nitrogen is limited. But under those conditions, these particular set of plants, they harbor the microorganisms and they're stimulated by them. And so there's a stimulus and it results in maybe better root growth, a better nitrogen uptake, and they're able to they're able to respond. So the point is, can we breed plants, can we actually breed corn? And I, I don't know the answer, this is just stimulating and very exciting, but can we actually breed this corn that will respond and harbor these microorganisms and respond to them in either way, in a facultative way? If it's if nitrogen is limiting, it will fix nit they may, may fix nitrogen. If nitrogen is not limiting, they stimulate the plant to grow better anyway. So that's I think think the long and the short of it. How much time have I got? Anybody? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Let's go just a little further. Um, okay. So the significance of this of this work is, is kind of interesting. It was a kind of a proof of concept to a certain extent. Of so getting close to a proof of concept. We have the conventional and the microfields hybrids. Um, you can see there was a lower percentage of starch in the grain, but higher percent protein, 27% more protein. The thionine, 42, these were high, high methionine uh, uh, lines, so 42% more methionine, 21% more lysine, 20% more cysteine. Uh, grain yields wasn't statistically significant, but slightly more grain protein, but that was probably because of, of the effect of the disinfection that it, it really hurt the conventional hybrids. Uh, protein, 40% more protein though, and 39% more essential amino acids. And, and so basically, the idea that we have is that if we can work this way with, with, with corn, we can grow corn that maybe even yields as well, but has this enormous protein advantage. And, and this, I think, is the right way to go forward in feeding the world is that instead of uh, trying to think that we're going to be producing 300 bushels per acre corn, to be thinking about producing crops that actually have better nutrient density, that really are more intense in terms of what they could do for, for uh, people and for animals and so on. If we look at the, the grain yield, the bushels per acre, and we look at the conventional hybrids, and we look at the protein content, or protein yield per acre, Protein yield per acre, how much pounds of, of protein per acre, and how much grain yield, you can see what the advantage is for these experimental hybrids. Is that they were uh, producing more, at the same yield level, they're producing more protein per acre. So that's exciting, I think. That's really, if we can move things along in that direction, I think we've got something really cool. Right. I, guess that's, I guess that's more or less it. Um, if we have time for some questions.